the word gospel means good news. And it must be good news for people that cannot live holy. Uh, the, the gospel is about how God loves sinners. Not how God blesses all those that do everything right. That's not the gospel. That is uh, uh, the message that if God can bless those that, or God loves the lovely, then there's no difference between Christianity and Islam. Because they also believe in a God that blesses those that do everything right. They also believe in a God that, uh, that blesses those who fulfill the law and keep to all the rules and regulations. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is the message of God's effort to save sinners. Not to save those who stopped sinning, to save sinners. That's the gospel. And, um, it's, it, and, and when I preach this in leader seminars, people get very uncomfortable because the message that has been preached all the time is how God will help you if you help yourself. Now that's not a gospel at all. You don't need a savior if you can save yourself. You don't, you don't need help if the message is help yourself, stop your rubbish, and then God will bless you. Because after you've stopped all your nonsense, you don't need somebody to bless you because you've blessed yourself. So the gospel is the message of how God loves sinners. And how His love and a revelation of His love brings forth a new life in us. And we have, um, we've made the born again experience uh, a one time prayer where we just say, Oh God, I'm sorry for my sin, forgive me. And now I'm born again. Now that is not what the, the Bible talks about. The born again experience is when a new person is born in your life through the power of the revelation of what Christ has done for mankind. You know there's a wonderful scripture in Romans chapter 5 verse 19 that says through the disobedience of one man we all became sinners. Okay? And in the same way through the obedience of the one. And you must go and read it in the Greek. It says, the same many that became sinners through the disobedience of Adam became righteous through Christ. Amen. If one man can make you a sinner, why can one man not make you righteous? If Adam, one man, could change the whole human race through his disobedience, why can one man, Jesus Christ, not through his obedience, change all of mankind in one day? But the gospel we've believed in is a gospel that says Jesus done something years ago and that wasn't actually significant. It only becomes powerful once you change your life yourself. Now that's not the gospel. The message that we preach is something, the true gospel is a message that we preach that is already true about every man. Before Jesus came, there was something that was true about every man. And that is that you will be saved by doing right. You will be saved by keeping the law. You will be saved by having knowledge of good and evil. Do the good thing and you shall be saved. And you shall be righteous before God. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God has redeemed mankind from that system. He has redeemed all of man from the system that says we are what we do. Jesus Christ is the representative of the whole human race. And what is true in Christ and what is done is true for every man. Now I tell you people can argue with me about it and differ from it, but then you'll have to differ with God. And you'll have to differ what, what Jesus Christ has done and what I believe in has got a proof 2,000 years ago that hanged upon a cross. And when He died, He died the death of a man that was under the law. Why did Jesus Christ come, people? I tell you something, we must stop to play church. We must stop to play the fool with religion because the religion will bite you and will kill you. The law system will destroy your life. I want to tell you something. The power of sin. Go and read it in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56. The power of sin is the law. 
Paul goes in Romans chapter 7 and he quotes the, one of the Ten Commandments. That one of the Ten Commandments, and he said, I find this law, that when I want to keep the law, there's a law in my members that brings forth sin. Then he quotes one of the Ten Commandments, and he says, when I say I don't want to lust, I find all manner of lust in my life. And this is the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I lived under sin. Then there was a time that I lived without the law, and I lived a holy life. But when the commandment came again, then sin revived. Paul had a sin revival in his life. And he got this revelation. My goodness, when I got into the message of grace, the message of God's influence upon the human heart to the point that the person of God manifests in a human being, to when, I, when I realized that, I saw Christ living in me. But when I was seeking justification and breakthrough through human effort, trying to copy God, I found sin manifesting in my life. One of the greatest sins ever committed was when Adam tried to copy God. We have not been called to copy God. We've been called to be a vessel where God lives in. And there's a big difference. If I take a, a Rolex watch and I take it to a jeweler and I tell him, make me an exact copy of this Rolex. An exact copy. And he does it so well that I can take it to the owner of the Rolex company. And the owner of the Rolex company cannot even see the difference. The one remains a fake. You can copy God and live a perfect holy life, say everything right, say everything good, live the holiest life there is, but outside of the revelation of God's grace, living, with, living a life from the foundation of grace, I want to tell you, you're a fake. You're a fake. We've not been called. I tell you, uh, uh, th that's why many people say these days, what's the difference between Buddhism and Christianity and Islam? Well, the way it's being preached most of the time these days, there's no difference. Because all of them believe in do good, get good, do bad, get bad. But Christianity is this. We believe in a God that justifies the ungodly. Hallelujah. That's the true gospel. A God that justifies the ungodly. Amen. Amen. I hear somebody says, where do you draw the line? Let me tell you where you, where you draw the line. This is the line. This is where you draw the line. God said, let me make the line. Who will be justified for free? He became a human being. And that's the line. If you're a human being, that's enough. Jesus did it for you. If you can believe in that, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will manifest the very person of God in your life, free from your effort. I've come to this revelation. I've, you know, I've, I've been a Bible school student in Potchefstroom. And I studied. I was a top Bible school student at Bible school. I got 90-something for everything. I, pray, I, pr I, 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 I literally prayed eight hours a day. Every day. I would get up at 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning, and pray all night. I'm not the, the pray where you sleep. I'm talking about the real prayer. Okay? Then I went to Bible school. After Bible school, I would spend two hours in the Word. And then I would not go to bed without leading somebody to Jesus. And after years of that, I realized I'm empty. I became a self-righteous jerk, thinking I'm better than everybody, because I can do right. To the point that I became depressed. And another preacher came and he preached the message of God's love for me. Changed my life. Hallelujah. And my prayer is that God empowers me to preach this gospel of grace, unashamedly, because this is the gospel that Paul preached. 
It's the gospel Jesus died for. That I can come and declare every man today that sits here, if you're a believer or not a believer, Jesus has redeemed you from the law system as the pathway unto salvation. He's redeemed the whole of mankind from that. In the same way as what 15 years ago, the, uh, the, there was an election and all of the South Africans has been redeemed from apartheid. You can, dep- you, you can raise the old South African flag at your house. That's your, do it if you want. And you can live under that if you want. But I want to tell you there's been a redemption. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God loves the world. Amen. Now let's go to one of the greatest scriptures there is. Let me just touch on finances quickly. The Bible says in Matthew 6, the greatest teaching on finances, if if this is all you know about money, and I'm talking to businessmen, it's more than enough. He says, look at the flowers. They do nothing. And they're blessed. Look at the birds. They don't even follow the principle of sowing and reaping. They don't even follow the principle of sowing and reaping. But your heavenly Father feeds them. And then the the principle of God of provision. He says, are you not worth more than they? God's provision for you financially is not a works provision. It's a worth provision. Discover your worth. Discover your worth. You are worth something. But if you believe that if you're a sinner or do something wrong, you're worthless, you will never have the boldness to say that God will care for me, for I'm worth something. You know how you determine the worth of something? It's very simple. It's by what somebody's prepared to pay for it. What is a rand worth today? Or what's a dollar worth? Seven rand fifty something. Because that's what people are willing to pay for it. If they're not willing to pay that for it, you know, then it's going to go down. So what's your worth? What God was prepared to pay for you? You've got the very same worth as the resurrected Christ. Discover your worth. The way God treats Jesus today, at the right hand of the Father, is the way God treats you. Do you think God's going to put Jesus through a hard time today in heaven to teach him something? If hard times was the teacher of the church, then then you'll find Zimbabwe sending missionaries to America. We don't have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors in hard times. A hard time is designed to make you doubt God. The love of God has has been designed to make you trust God. And I believe that the true message of God's love for sinners must come back to the church. And must come back to the hearts of businessmen. Hallelujah. Where you can feel loved. I want to tell you, every one of you, and, and you know we are men, sometimes we're so stubborn. I don't care how stubborn you are, but inside your heart there's a desire to be pampered. No, not me. Well, I want to tell you, the Bible says that God pampers the church. No, I don't believe that. Go and read it. Ephesians 5.23. He says He dresses us in dazzling white silk through the beautiful words that He speaks to us. There's nothing as wonderful as standing in the presence of a God that cannot say one bad thing about me. Only good. No bad thing, but there must be a balance. There is a balance. Let me explain to you the balance there is. God was in heaven. And this is the word righteousness, the Hebrew word for righteousness. God was in heaven. On the one side of a scale. Remember, I don't know these days anymore, but years ago at the shop, if you wanted to buy sweets, they had the scale. You know? So they put a little weight in the one side and then they put sweets in the other side until it balances out. Now that's where the Hebrew word righteousness comes from. is to balance out. God was in heaven and the one side of the scale and the thing was like this. 
and then man was on the other side here, just dust, speck of dust. You can never balance a thing out. So God said, man, the only way I can get man to qualify for blessing, now that was righteousness, to qualify for eternal life. He says, the only way I can do it is if I, God, stay in heaven, and I incarnate myself into that speck of dust, on the other side as well, through my Holy Spirit, so that God in heaven and God on earth, and the other side of the scale, can balance this thing out. And God incarnated Himself into human flesh, balancing the scale between us and God. So that we today can go boldly to the throne room of grace and receive salvation from the condemnation of judgment through faith in Christ. That's why it's impossible to be saved without faith. Let's go and just touch on uh, a very well-known scripture, John 3.16. I'm going to say some things, it's just, it might just rattle the cage a bit, but I've got a wonderful website, um, dynamicministries.com, and you can go and download 400 messages for free there. Sure. <laughs> Hallelujah. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. For God so loved the world. Do you know that that word love um, is the Greek word agape? Now I want to talk about that love that produces belief in God. It's impossible for you to decide to believe something. It's impossible. It's like seeing people, murdering people all the time, and then you now must decide to believe they're going to be good to you. Belief is a fruit of knowledge. Belief is something that rises in the heart of a person when he looks at all the facts, belief or unbelief. So, if I want to sell you uh, something today, and I always use this analogy, and it's such a, such a good one. If somebody comes to your house and he wants to sell you a Kirby vacuum cleaner, you know, when you see him coming to the door, you're already upset. I had a guy the other day, they, they said to me, um, I've got somebody that will wash your carpet for you for free. Now, I thought it was blessing the ministry, you know. But it was a demo. <laughs> So here comes the guy with this Kirby, and he starts to explain and everything. I says, you don't have to explain, just wash the carpet. Yeah. He says, no, no, this is a demo. He says, okay, let me listen. So I'm already upset, because I don't want to buy a Kirby. I don't need a Kirby. I've only got one carpet in my house. It's in my studio where I preach. It's expensive. You know, how could, I don't want a Kirby. I thought the thing cost 7,000 Rand. So after he, he's busy demonstrating, I don't want to hear anything. But as he starts to speak... Then I start to listen. And after 20 minutes, I'm thinking on, what can I sell to buy this thing? Because the information He gives you persuades your heart, <coughs> makes you believe in it. And that's why many times we struggle to believe God. When you come to a hard time financially, or a hard time in your marriage, or a hard time in anything, we struggle to believe, because the information we've received about the person of God does not allow you to believe in Him. doesn't allow you. There, there are many things, and, and, I, and, I, and I want to challenge you, go to my website and listen to some of the stuff I preach there on the love of God. It will bless you, because I cannot in this short time explain everything. I think of my wife. Imagine I take my wife and um, we drive. It's a very hot day. Like mom's really becomes 40 something. And it's 40 something degrees Celsius. And I stop and I tell her, can you just check the tire on the left back there, please? You know, and she gets out. And when she gets out, I close the door and lock the car. And it's 45 outside. And she says, hey, open the door, man. You've got air condition inside. I says, no. You've got your desert experience now. (laughs) 
Trust me. <laughs> Believe in me. I love you so much. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll sit right here in the air-conditioned car while you're frying outside. <laughs> Somebody else comes there and say now, but what are you busy with? Why is your wife outside? No, we're building relationship. <laughs> we're purifying our marriage. Hallelujah. Why are you doing it in such a way? I only do what I see my father do. He takes my stuff away, allows things to happen to me, to purify me, so now I just do what I see to, I do it to her. People, we've preached the gospel that's not in line with the character of God. I tell you the truth. And we've mentioned things that's not in line with the character of God. We need to humble our hearts and say, God, I bow my knee to your love. And your grace, wherein you've honored us and blessed us with the value of God by giving His Son to us. Amen. God so loved the world. I want to tell you that God, when I started to realize who God is, belief started to arise in my heart. If my wife, if I do that to her like I've just explained, do you think it's possible for her to believe in me? To trust me that I'll do good to her? And just before she dies, I just open the door and get in. I said, and then I tell her, you see, I told you I'll be good to you. My goodness, man. You know what? The first guy that stops there with another car is going to take a lift with him. In the very same way, that's why people backslide, if you want to call it backslide. That's why people struggle to continue to prayer, to pray. That's why, because there's nothing that produces prayer. There's nothing that produces love for God. It is a fear to go to hell. It's a fear to be disobedient. And a big thing that I've seen amongst businessmen is, I want to live right because I don't want to lose my business. People, there's a greater motivator than that in life. It's the truth about God's love for man. God's captivated with you. I tell you, he said, it is, it's nicer for me to live in you through the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm, I was willing to leave heaven. He was willing to give his spirit from heaven to come and live in you. For the spirit, you are a better place than heaven. So what does God see what you don't see? God lives from a certain reality. That we need to start to wake up to and live in so that we can find belief in our hearts. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That's the word agape. The word agape in the Greek has got many meanings. But one of the root meanings is to be content with. God was so content with the world that he gave his son for the world. No, Bertie, but how could God be content with the world? God was so upset with the world that he gave his son so that he could change the world. No, no, that's not what the word agape means. God was so content with the world that He said, I am happy to buy this with my son. It's like when you go and buy a car. Will you pay before you're happy? Will you pay before you are satisfied that what you buy is worth what you pay? God was so happy with the world in their sin that He gave His son the word content. Hallelujah. I've always learned that the word agape is just a God kind of love. Now, that doesn't define the thing to me. You know the word agape comes from a Hebrew word, agab, which is used I think only six times in the Bible. And most of the time from the book Ezekiel, which speaks about uh, the lovers of a, a woman that's got many lovers. It talks about sensual love. The word agape. It, it literally means to lose your breath. Now, I'm sure the men here will know what I talk about. You know, when I was, um, I, I think, I remember the first time I saw my wife. <clears throat> she came, um, we were at a, at a church camp. And I, I was a preacher there. You know, and I, I went down to preach at this camp. 
And she came up, she was a student in the university, I was a student in the Bible school. So she came from the hall and she went to her room and I came from my room to the, down to the hall. And I saw her, and when I saw her, I said, God help me. Hallelujah. Satan, I bind you. You know? And I just felt this, this in my heart, I felt this, this, this uh, man, my, my breathing changed. My heartbeat changed. You know, it, it's really like that. if they could put sensors on me, they would say something very drastic has happened to this guy now. Now that is the word agab, where we get the word agape. It's to lose your breath in adoration. As I saw this beautiful woman and I lost my breath. And that is what the Bible says. That's the wording God uses for God and the lost world. They're not worthless. The lost world's not worthless. We were not worthless. We were worth something. The problem is that we were only lost. If somebody steals your cell phone, what's it worth? Exactly what you paid for it. The only thing is it's just lost its position. It's in another man's hands. And the guy who stole it can never become the legal owner. You're the possession of God, man. And the lost world out there, they're the possession of God. The earth and the fullness thereof belong to God. But the problem is, man, God's valuable possession was lost through a system where, that Adam implemented that said, I can be like God by knowledge of good and evil. I want to know good, and I want to know bad. I'll make some good decisions. I'll live right, and then I'll be like God. Adam was already like God when God made him. But then Satan says you can be like God from a different platform, not from God indwelling, but, but from you doing so, so he implemented a system that brought so much death. But here God comes and he redeems man from that. You know, if, you've got, if, if you walk in the street and you see a hundred rand under the bush, I mean, what happens in your heart when you see that hundred rand there? Your heartbeat changes. Oh, God's provided, hallelujah. You know, you look around, you've seen it. That's for me. And then you go with great effort and man, you will sometimes even humiliate yourself to get a hold of the hundred. In the same way, that's what happened to us. We were that sheep that God lost. And then God did everything to get the sheep back. In the same way, mankind got lost through the law system and God has done everything possible to bring us back. Amen. Where we live by God indwelling us and not by anything else. You know, you know, I've got little Jack Russell at home. I don't need to give that dog five lessons in how to bark. I tell you, I don't lie to you. It's the truth. The dog, we, we, that dog is so wonderful, we never took it to barking classes. It barks by itself, I tell you. Yeah, he, I don't know why, but he's one of those dogs that bark by itself. And you know that Jack Russell? He's got so much faith. He believes he can, he, with one breath, he can inhale the burbul next door. <laughs> he never even went to a class for that. He does it by nature. Now, when I teach him how to eat at the table... Sometimes he struggles, you know. He can't get that right. I, can, I give him those rules. I tell him, you keep to this. But I find him doing his own nature. Because nature is stronger than a rule. So God came to give us his nature. So that we don't have to go for five classes and how to live. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do. For God so loved the world, so agape the world. He lost His breath over us. When God saw the world in His lost state, He lost His breath at two things. The value that we have and the fact that this valuable possession was lost. 
That's why he came and he, he gave everything to buy. It's, it's like the, the, the field, you know. The Bible says the kingdom of God is like a, a treasure hidden in a field. That a guy goes and he sells everything to buy the field to get the treasure. So God came and he gave everything to buy the field to get the treasure, which is you. You are God's treasure, man. You're not God's slave. We have been slaves. We've been made sons. And there's a difference in, in, in the way I treat my son and what I treat the people that work at the house. My son is an heir. I talk to him in a different way because I want him to take over what I do one day. I treat him and train him in a different way. I speak to him as my son. In the very same way, I want to tell you, that's how God treats you. He treats you in the similitude of Jesus Christ himself. For Jesus is a human being representing the human race. What's true in Christ is true in you, my friend. And make that your reality. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make that your reality. The problem that we have these days is that we don't understand. And, and I like what the brother said about the blank page between the, the Old and the New Testament. <coughs> Take the blank page out and read the New into the Old. You know, if I write my wife a letter, if I'm in Zambia, <coughs> in the, I remember years ago before there were cell phones, I was preaching in, in Zambia. And you would go away for two months and not speak to your wife or children. You know, then your mind starts to play games with you. I might come home and she's already dead and buried. They can't contact me. You know? And then I got this analogy when I was there. Imagine I write her a letter. And I say, My boki! And for the English people, I don't know. Sorry, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> and that letter, and in the meantime, I become the next Billy Graham. And 500 years from now, people are studying my life and reading biographies and whatever, and they discover this letter that I posted to my wife that got lost in the post. And the letter said that I call her an animal, my boki. And when I come home, I'm going to eat her. I'm a cannibal. Because I'm going to eat my wife. And then from there, a, a, a theory gets discovered that I had more than one wife because I can only eat the wife once. You see, you cannot understand my letter before you know me. You cannot understand this book before you know God. Let me tell you something. You cannot, dis you cannot understand what God said before you've made up your mind that God is only love. This book is written in the language of love for mankind. And if that is not your mind, if you've got some back door open of a judgmental God that's angry, that's this and that, you will not understand what this book says. I'm telling you the truth before God. When I understood God's love for me, God's respect for me, how He's, how He's made me, with what adoration He speaks to man. When I started to understand that God got more right in Jesus than what, Adam got, than what Satan got right in Adam, m my whole view of the Bible changed. I started to see what Christ has done for us. I started to live in the obedience of Christ on my behalf. Do you know how wonderful it is to go and stand before God and whatever you ask Him, you know that you qualify 100% because the obedience of Jesus is written behind your name. Hallelujah. The obedience of Christ is written behind our name. Now what did Jesus come to do? How was this love of God manifested? And I'm going to end off with this. The love of God was manifest in a very simple way. The Bible says, herein is the love of God. That He gave His Son to be the sacrifice for our sins. 
Okay. Now, what death did Jesus die? Why, why did He have to die? Why did He have to become a man? Why couldn't God just say, well, I forgive everybody? I mean, what's wrong with God's heart that He says now, no, I'm going to give my son, then he's going to die, then he's going to be raised, then you must now believe in him, and then he's now going to save those who believe. And Why such a difficult way? Couldn't God just say, like we say to people that steal from us and, and do things wrong, just say, well, I forgive you, and then really forgive from the heart. Why did God have this difficult way? You see, if we can understand what happened in Adam, was when Adam sinned, it was the sin he committed was implementing a works system as a pathway unto God. Then Jesus, according to Galatians 4, was born a man under the law, representing the human race, called the lost Adam. Okay. He's not the second Adam, he was the lost of the Adamic race. Born under the law. And then here was a man, the whole world represented in one man. And then he died. So what happened to the man that found his relationship with God on the basis of his good works? He died. He is dead. Let me explain it to you this way. Imagine my wife decides one day, that, I mean I'm good to her, I love her. So I'm the best husband there is. And I love her with all my heart. And then the neighbor comes and lies to her. And she walks away with a neighbor. She divorces me. She takes the neighbor. And now at night, and, but this, this guy is really a boss, you know. He puts rules on the fridge. Tell her, this is how you'll cook. This is how you'll clean the house. This is how you do this. This is how you do this. And then if she doesn't do it, then he beats her up. Then she comes under the wrath of that new husband. And now I'm in bed at night and I hear how he is beating her up next door. And I love her with all my heart. And I want her back. How will I get her back? Because I cannot just go and shoot the guy. That's against the law. Because she's legally married to him now. And she's divorced from me. She wanted to go. She got married to the other guy. How will I ever get her back? I want, to, I want to marry her again. I want her to be my wife. My passion is after her. I still value her the way I valued her when I was married to her. The fact that she belongs to somebody else has not changed my heart for her. It's changed her life, but not my life. It's changed her life. So now I want her back. The only way that I can get her back legally. I cannot just go and shoot the guy. I, I cannot just go and uh, try and I can only offer me because then I act in the same way as what this other guy acted. How will I get it right? The, the only way is if and, and God did it. If I could incarnate myself into Him and then die. I mean, because if her husband dies, then she's free to marry another, isn't it? So, if, 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 if we know that's how it works. If you married and your wife dies, or if you married and you die, then your wife is under no obligation to stay faithful to you. She can go and get married to another person, isn't it? In the same way, we were married to the system that says, we are what we do. We were married to the way that says, we are righteous by our works. Then Jesus became a man under the law. He became that man. And then died. <coughs> then he died. According to Romans 7. So that through the body of Jesus, we became dead to the law. Hallelujah. And know what Jesus then did? Then he rose again. <laughs> By the Holy Spirit. And now he comes and he proposes. He says, will you marry me? This is Jesus now, in human flesh. Please marry me. You qualify already. You don't have to do the things on the fridge to qualify. I've loved you all the time. The only thing is you were legally married to someone else, and I wanted you legally back. 
So I had to incarnate myself into this husband of law. That's why many people confuse what Jesus Christ has said. Because Jesus said many law things when he was on the earth. For he was the man under the law. And then gave the revelation of grace to the apostle Paul. So that we can understand what Jesus said by the writings of Paul. Thank you Jesus for that gospel man. (laughs) Thank you Jesus that did die the Lord death for me. So that I can be married to another. And listen to this. And this is many people's fear. You know the gospel of grace is just a license to sin. My goodness. The word grace is the Greek word that says. The influence of God on the belief system of a man. To bring forth the nature of God in a man. That's a Greek word for grace. So how can you say the influence of God on the heart of a man. Through his love in Christ will give you a license to sin. No ways. Paul says that by the law, sin got its opportunity and killed me. Go and read Romans 7. Paul says by the law, that which I don't want to do, that I do. But then he says by grace, that which I always wanted to do, I find effortlessly manifesting in my life. Because I've got a new reference. My reference is the life of Christ is my life. I don't have another life. The only reference that God has to our lives is the resurrected life of Christ. Now he says, be married to Christ so that you can bear much fruit. He says, for when you were under the law, you were bearing the fruit of death through the ministration of death written on stones. Have you ever, do you know the Bible says the ministration of death was written on stones? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 and 7. The ministry of death was written on stones. Paul says, remember there's a scripture in um, Proverbs that says, there's a way that looks as if it leads unto life, but the end is death. It doesn't talk about adultery. It doesn't talk about sin. Everybody knows, as you drunk, seip, gaan jou hevelik verloor, jy gaan jou bezigheid verloor, allemaal weer het. We know that is the pathway of death. But there's a pathway that looks unto life, but the end is death. And that is what Paul called the ministration of death written on stones, my friend. And the problem is we got married to Christ, but we're still whoring with a corpse. I know it's radical words, but that is what's happening. We cannot do that. Every verse here, you know the Bible says Jesus is the word. I'm ending off for a second time. Jesus is the Word. So if you want to read the Word in the Bible, and you don't read Jesus, you're not reading the Word of God, my friend. You're reading the letter. There was a woman caught in the very act of adultery. She was brought before Jesus. She was in the, caught in the act of adultery. Then they said, the Scripture says, so there was the woman caught in the act Who was present? The woman, the Pharisees, standing with the Scriptures, and the Word of God. Okay. Are you hearing me? There was the Scriptures, there was the woman, and there was the Word of God, called Jesus Christ. The Scripture says, you must be killed. But Word of God... What's God's word on this? I don't condemn you. So I want to tell you, if you read the Bible, and it's not the message of no condemnation, you're not reading the word of God. You're reading the scriptures, and you are standing on the authenticity of the scriptures, thinking because that's what the, but the scripture says. What does the word of God say? The Greek word for word is the word logos, which means the logic. The best way to explain it is the correct interpretation of every scripture. The word logos means, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, if I say in Afrikaans, the appel val nie ver van die boom nie. Hmm? The letter is about the apple and the tree, but the word is this child's like the father. So are you reading the letter or are you reading the word of God? I will tell you, God's word about every man became flesh so that nobody has to doubt about the meaning of Hebrew or Greek words. God's word is, I represent you and who I am, I made you. If you can believe it, you'll have life. If you cannot believe it, you'll have death. 
And God's word about man became flesh and dwelt upon the earth, died off the law man, was raised up in newness of life so that we can be saved by faith. Hallelujah! Why did the Israelites of old did not enter into the promised land? Because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Unbelief caused them to die. But righteousness and belief in Jesus will cause us to live. Amen.